You're listening to an Anderson Entertainment production. This episode, we're skating away in Fab Facts. Five, four, three, part two of our interview with Chris Bentley is go. Oh, um, F-A-B, yeah. and that's all coming up in part 225. Of the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Three, two, one. It's too late now. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> H- hello there, hello, uh, hello, hello. Dick you're James Nick. P.I. Yeah, well, that's oh, what I, no, I'm you're... just sort of getting into into in my role as, you know, as a police officer on Demeter City. You know, yes, just, you know. they say that? <laughs> they, I don't think they ever did, no. No, not, it doesn't feel very sci-fi and alien, does it? No, it doesn't, you're right, no. Perhaps that's why they didn't do it. Um, well, I'm well, amazed. I didn't write it. No, <laughs> I, yeah. Who knows what it would have been like then? Uh, perhaps a, a crossover with a Victorian uh, edition of Space Briefing. Anyway, I love <laughs> the fact that uh, only nine seconds into the podcast, you've already managed to squeeze in a uh, mention of Space Precinct. Well, be rude not to. Uh, I think it probably uh, it would be fine not to. Oh. Anyway, oh. Uh, him over there mentioning Space Precinct relentlessly yes. is Richard what? N. James, previous oh, star me. of amazing Anderson shows such as Space mm-hmm. Precinct. yes. Terrorhawks. Yes. And First Action Bureau. You're right, amongst many others. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, you can't get rid of him, really. No. Uh, which is rather marvellous, and thank oh. goodness we can't. Uh, I'm uh, Jamie Anderson, son of the late, great Jerry Anderson. And uh, yes. together, we talk about all things Anderson for a bit here on this Mostly. there Jerry Anderson podcast. But yeah. don't worry, there is some light relief later in the form <laughs> of Chris Randomized Dale, who turns up, does his thing, talks about a random episode, and then flies off again. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. I mean, he has an easy life, doesn't he, really? I mean, he re- yeah, just turns up, takes yeah, all the glory, he? and then disappears. Yeah, I know. We do all the hard work. Cheeky oh. devil he is. Anyway, uh, all of that hard work involves many things. And this week, mm. Richard James, I thought for a bit of a change. Yes. We could do things in the order that they arrive, but in right. an alternating fashion. So what I will oh. say is, after we've done this introductory yeah. thing, we will go straight into Fab Facts, where I've got a book of Fab Facts, and I give you, yeah. hopefully, a Fab Fact from the Anderson universe. And right. then... Right, following Fab Facts, then we'll probably have a bit of a chat, and then we'll go straight into the Jerry Anderson newsy, news, 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 because there's always something happening in the Jerry Anderson universe. That's always the case. Yes. Uh, and after that, and also in between these things, Richard mm-hmm. will be plucking uh, news items and, and thoughts and messages and comments from around the uh, social media Anderverse, from lovely yes. podsterons and beyond. Yes. After which point, we will go into, well... Uh, a continuation. Part two, uh, yes, of your interview with Chris Bentley, uh, talking all things uh, Jerry Anderson and volts and things like that. Brilliant. Undoubted. Very good. Right. That's yes, quite good. right. Okay. And then oh. the aforementioned right. Chris Dale, the randomizer, yep. will turn up, do his randomizer, and that will basically bring us to a close when we'll say some things and have some closing yeah. um, comments. Closing right? thoughts and summaries. Yes, that's right. Okay. Gosh, well, that went quite uh, sort of better than I expected, it really. It was a bit clunky, but bearing in oh, mind we've right. not done that yet, I thought no, that's it was true. all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did Ooh, okay, mm. well, there we go. Uh, mm. If you'd like to comment on anything we say, do, don't do, or don't say, then please email us podcast at jerryanson.com or you can talk to us on social media, primarily Twitter, where you can find him, Richard N. James, me, I'm Jamie Anderson, and him, the randomizer, Chris Dalek. Uh, but also hashtag us, Jerry Anderson Podcast. I mean, I'm just sitting back enjoying the show. Carry oh, on. What a change. Uh, also, yeah, do, what do you think of our nice. new podcast art pods are on? So, I mean, if, if it's the uh, first time you've listened to us, then to you it's the first time you've seen the art and it's normal. Yeah. But for everybody yeah. else, they've gone 223 pods with the same art. Lovely art by I know. Chris Thompson. But we, 
You yeah. felt it was time for a change. Change, yeah, my dear. A refresh. <laughs> um, yes, there's, there's so many Doctor Who quotes we could apply. Uh, somebody did, of course, post the you've de- redecorated, yes. I don't like it clip. Yes. Uh, so thank right. you for that. But uh, I, I think it's rather lovely. It's very, very contemporary, isn't it? Well, I wouldn't know. I'm not being contemporary myself. I don't know what is contemporary, really. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll take your word for it. A, a change is as good as a rest, yes. maybe. And so, yes. therefore... That's good. Yes. Right, shall we move along swiftly to uh, my bit? <laughs> if we must. Well, it sort of is mine, isn't it? It's yeah. Fab Facts. Nothing to do with me. Now, time for this week's Fab Facts. I say it's my bit. Really, it's a collaborative effort because is I it? have a book of Fab Facts here, ah, which yes. I will flick through. But then without Richard, I make... I would never stop flicking. No, it would be um, an infinite flick. Absolutely. But thankfully, he's here to shout fab, which will stop yeah. me in my flicking. Uh, and yeah. hopefully we will happen upon a fab fact. So, Richard, yeah. are you ready with your arresting shout? I was going to say something rude there. <laughs> <laughs> Born ready. Brilliant. Then here we go. Fab. Mm. Uh, my slow flicking has done yes. as well here. Ah, I see. Because rather I than ending up in the sixties or the the mid to late sixties or early seventies as we so often do, we are in fact here in a different era of Anderson. Now, Ooh. on previous episodes of the Jerry Anderson podcast, we have often joked, and I think you've been quite serious about space precinct on ice. Yeah, what's wrong with that? Well. There's a few things, but <laughs> I think perhaps there is a precedent that's been set here. Because did you know that an older Anderson show did once appear on skates? Really? <laughs> well, let's find out. In 1962, The Wizard of Oz yep. was performed on ice uh, as a show at the Empire Pool Wembley. Ah. Produced and directed by Gerald Palmer from an adaptation by theatrical impresario Tom Arnold, the festivities yeah. included an appearance by none other than Mike Mercury himself. Oh, really? Ah, uh, yes. Ah. The square-jawed hero took to the ice in a life-size supercar that oh. reportedly cost £2,500 to make. In 1962? Yes. Crikey. I mean, shall I do some quick research to see... What uh, that would equate to in today's money. Yeah, let's find an inflation it's calculator at least very, very quickly. Multiply that by ten, I would think. Oh, I don't know about that. So what yeah. was this? This was two and a half thousand yeah. pounds. In 1962. In 19... I've got to scroll down the list now. This is an exciting so, fact. 60 fact, years later. Mm-hmm. Cost 681 pounds. 30, wow. 37 yeah. grand for a life-size yeah. model of supercar. Goodness nice. me. And nice. for, our, for our listeners in the United States... That's thirty-seven thousand dollars. Thirty-seven thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look at us making jokes about uh, economic ah. matters. Anyway, yes. uh, this uh, icy program, uh, which you can find online, oh, the printed version includes a message ah. from Mike encouraging the guests to shout "Fire one" when the uh, engine rev counter reached fifteen thousand, ah, uh, okay. and to sign up for, of course, the Supercar Fan Club, which you get your little badge oh. and your license. Oh. Uh, one photo exists. What, of Mike Mercury? Yes, indeed. And right. the performer is credited as one Robert Young. OK, I'll have a look for that. Now, although we don't have any record of what happened to this ice-worthy supercar, blogger yeah. Phil Aldridge, who was in attendance, recalls that it was quite exciting to see it in person. I bet. However, we don't really know much beyond that. So, Posterons, mm. were you or a relative or friend present to see Supercar on Ice? Yes, OK. At the lump- Empire Pool Wembley yeah. in 1962. Yes. Right. I mean, it's very specific. You, you it couldn't is, have missed yeah. it if you were there. Yeah, yeah. But what kind of story would you tell with Mike, Beaker, Mitch and the gang on ice? And mm. we'd love to know, really, which other Anderson show you think would be best on skates. Let us well, know. We know. Podcast. We know no, Richard, we don't know. Let what? us know. Podcast oh, at jerryanson.com with your genuine thoughts. and uh, Probably not Space Precinct on ice. Oh, right. Fair enough. So yeah, interesting. So this Phil Aldridge, does he bear, bear a sort of passing resemblance to Mike Mercury? Or have what, you found no, picture of No, because Phil was the, was the one who was there in, as, oh, in oh, the oh, audience. Oh, oh, Robert that, Young, you mean. And that's it. That's the one. Yes. Well, uh, I mean, well, Phil Aldridge, Aldridge might also <laughs> bear a passing wouldn't, resemblance. Wouldn't that be a coincidence? The one person who's written about it and remembers it looks like, looks like Mike, Mike Mercury. Mercury. Yeah. 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 
so no any anyone who was there or knows any more about it we'd love to know more and we'd love to try and find some more photos email us podcast at jerryanderson.com and also with your suggestions your serious suggestions for which show oh. would be best on ice but also there's some not so serious so they're all, all right and the not so serious yeah. ones yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah very good i mean you could do an interesting uh kind of balletic big rat i suppose if you wanted to do <laughs> joe 90 on ice couldn't you <laughs> okay very you could do that yes. easy to get the spin going yeah, that's right. That's true. It's stopping it will be the problem. I well, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, anyway, we'd love to know your thoughts. Uh, <laughs> but I think that probably brings us uh, glissando sliding style oh, to the end lovely. of this week's Ice, Ice Fact. Fact. Yes, there you go. Nice. I like it. Now, I tell you what, I'm sat here uh, with my iPad ready to read out some uh, lovely emails from our podstrons who've been emailing us at... Uh, podcast at jerryanderson.com <laughs> why, why does well, that present such a struggle jerryanderson well, at podcast.com because pod anderson at jerry dot something no, because while i'm talking i'm actually doing a quick google images search for rob young as mike mercury i see to see if i can find any pictures and the answer to that question is yeah oh okay well there is a rob young yeah on Wikipedia, and he does look a little bit like Mike Mercury. That's an older picture of him. Oh. Uh, Robert George Young, February 22nd, 1907, uh, lived until 1998, was an American film, television, and radio actor. Could be him. Oh, Don't know. Interesting. I doubt it. Would he be, you know, would he be appearing in Wembley as Mike Mercury? Well, you never know, because lots of lots of American and Canadian actors came over to the yeah. UK to, for jobs, so yeah. why not? And a, a gig's a gig, isn't it? Let's face it. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, moving swiftly on, yes. uh, if you could find it, Podstrons, do send us a link because I'd love to know more about Rob Young. Uh, now, we have had some emails, as I said. Uh, AC, for example, who we know and, uh, and love, says, uh, Good evening, gents. Here's a fab fact. I never thought I'd believe a crossover between New Captain Scarlet and Thunderbirds 2004. I was watching the New Captain Scarlet episode Trap for a Rhino and did a double take when I noticed the magazine that Cadet Johnson was reading at Spectrum's flight training school. The magazine in question is called Cyber Nation, a fictitious publication that was originally created as set dressing for Brain's Lab in the live-action Thunderbirds no. movie. Yes! Really? He says, I happen to own the original magazine prop of from the film, which he is does. why I recognised it. Of course he does. Uh, as Dominic Lavery worked on both projects, I can only assume that the digital assets used to create the prop were still available and were simply reused in Captain Scarlet when the scene called for a magazine cover. So there we go. Conclusive proof, says AC that both Thunderbirds 2004 and New Captain Scarlet exist in the same universe, albeit set 48 years apart. <laughs> that's a very there old copy of the same magazine. Well, <laughs> exactly, that's right. <laughs> but, you know, that is indeed conclusive proof, sure. Uh, it must be, yeah. There is, there's no evidence <laughs> for it, but it is scientific fact. Yeah, now Matt Edmonds got in touch to say, hello, esteemed hosts. He says, I recently bought a new computer and one of the first things I like to do is personalise the desktop wallpaper. I thought there must be some Anderson-related wallpaper available, but couldn't find anything good online. Is there any chance of producing some official wallpaper from the shows that could be bought from the store? I would happily pay for packs of high-quality images of, say, Anderson vehicles or stills from the Super Marination series or some of the newer artwork from the audiobooks or the calendar. I think a high-res Thunderbird 5 would look fantastic. Anyway, says my, uh, Matt, rather enjoying all the Anderson content you put out there. Thank you. Kind regards. Oh. Yeah. Lovely. That's a thought, isn't it? I mean, wallpaper, we've done bits and pieces before, for sure. Mm. Um, but, mm. Mm, yeah, mm. It, it's, it's funny, isn't it? Because some people, they really love kind of that kind of stuff, but a lot of people just don't really care about their yeah. wallpaper that much. Yeah. yeah so sure. I don't know. We, it's something we could experiment with, for sure. Yeah, and also, you know, perhaps I'm being naive, but what's to stop you just searching for some HD images online and just, you know... Oh, there's plenty of Downloading around. them. And, yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. But there we are. Now, this is from Steve, who says, Dear Jamie and Richard, ahead of your interview with Chris Bentley, uh, will there be a reissue of Captain Scarlet the Vault and the complete book of UFO? They appear to be out of print, and you can only purchase second-hand copies on Amazon at silly prices. I'm in possession of Thunderbirds and Space 1999 vaults, and they give an excellent insight into how these programmes are made. For instance... I didn't realise my former landlord auditioned for a part in season two of Space 1999. Great podcast as always regards Steve. Steve, well, you have to let us know more. Give us names and uh, tell us a bit more about that audition. That sounds interesting. Mm. Um, but yes, any hope of a reissue of Captain Scarlet or the complete book of UFO? I don't think so Steve. at this stage, yeah. sadly. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I've, I mean, we speak to Mark at Signum Books occasionally, and uh, yeah, I, I just don't think it's on the on the horizon, yeah. sadly. Unless you know, as we always say, unless they were bombarded with emails and messages. Absolutely, then, bombardment you know. does often work as a marketing, <laughs> as a as a, a sort of consumer tactic. It does, yeah. Here's one from Pam March, who I like to call Pam Marchy March March March, of course, who says, Hi there, hope you're all well. I've got a question from Michael Morris. He's asking if you'll be doing a Terror Hawks podcast in a few weeks' time, because, of course, it'll be 10-10. 10 10 uh, next October week. 10th, yes. Mm, yes, indeed. I'm sure we'll do something a bit Terror yeah. Hawks-y. Yeah, it'd be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah, but uh, I, don't, I don't know what yet, because um, yeah. we haven't decided. No, fair <laughs> enough. And finally for now, Stephen Watson... Uh, a.k.a. The Impodsteron has got in touch to say hi both, you lovely presenters, and of course, the fine Mr. Dale. Since you invited suggestions, here's one I had to send in order to stop me shouting at my iPhone every week. Uh, this is uh, on the subject of anderongs, things that people get wrong in the Anderson universe. And Jamie, you might want to listen to this one. Uh-oh. Uh, Stephen says, Jamie says every week that and our randomizer pushes the big red button to choose a random Jerry Anderson episode, or roughly that, but no... Chris spends the entire intro getting someone else to press mm. the big red button. There, he says, I feel much better now. Yours affectionately, Stephen Watson. He's right. It is quite a significant and wrong. And I did take it note is. of your email last week and try you to am- amend my ways slightly. Yes, yes. The yes, thing yes. is, when Chris does his thing, we don't know mm. what he's going to do. So no, that's true. I mean, yeah. the idea is generally that he's supposed to press the big red button because that's the randomizer's job. Yes. But sometimes he can't be bothered. Mm. Mm. Or he looks at somebody else, or he has an adventure, or he can't do it. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But you know what I mean. Basically, Chris is somewhat responsible for the activation of the randomizer, probably, mm. mostly. That's that's quite unconvincing, if you don't mind me saying. <sighs> mm. I'll do my best. Yeah. But there we are. Uh, that's all the emails for now. Keep them coming in. Podcast at jerryanderson.com. I'll read about next week for sure. Hmm. Can't yeah. wait. Mm, While we do wait, though. Yes. Would you like a little bit of Jerry Anderson news? Oh, bring on the news! Uh, then it's time for some Jerry Anderson news. Yes, sir. It's your regular edition of the Jerry Anderson news. News, 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 news. Interesting news. Doppler effect you went for. You like that, did you? Yeah, yeah. it's very nice. Good. It's very nice. Uh, I was trying, trying to segue neatly from Doppler to doppelganger to UFO, but I can't oh, quite manage it. Well, um, I think you just did. Yes, there you go. Done. Very neatly. Nobody yeah. noticed a thing. Nope. It was so seamless. seamless. Thank yeah. you. Uh, have you managed to secure your copy of the UFO <gasps> Technical Operations oh. Manual, Podstrom? I don't know. Have you? You have? Oh, good. Uh, well, if you haven't yet, then the price, the pre-order price has got tomorrow. That's uh, Tuesday ah. the 4th of October. So we kept the price the same for the standard edition as the uh, the Moonbase book, even though um, oh, yeah. manufacturing and paper costs and all sorts of rocketed since last year. Yeah, uh, since last week, I should imagine. They, they have. Oh, yes. Unfortunately, mm. that is something we're all dealing with right now. But there we go. Yeah. But the price will go up tomorrow. So uh, if you want to grab it, grab it while you still can. I've got no idea if there are any special editions, uh, special editions still available or not, because we're recording mm. this so far out. If there are any, you might want to grab them uh, now, because I'm sure they'll disappear before too long. Uh, yeah. And um, yes, uh, I mean, exciting. I, I hope, well, uh, uh, surely... If you've got the Space 1999 book, uh, this, this is a perfect companion, isn't it? To yes, have it's the same, same format, Absolutely. same style. It sits love on the shelf it. nicely next to it, uh, so it'll yeah. be a rather lovely thing. So there you yeah, go. Yeah, what's next? The toilets at uh, the station house on uh, Precinct 88? Space Precinct Technical and, Manual. Uh, yeah. you, you, never, you never know. <laughs> you, you never, never know. know. Uh, anyway, that's all things UFO. I uh, hope you enjoyed uh, our Thunderbirds Day extravaganza last week on the 30th. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, so you would have seen of course you did well we know you had fun Uh, and a lovely curry afterwards as well yeah that was great wasn't it yeah it was almost worth doing Fab Live just to get to the curry wasn't it almost he says but not quite okay well thanks for that Uh, you will have noticed the Thunderbirds calendar which was released on Friday for pre-order will be shipped uh, very very soon actually as well as a new range of t-shirts featuring the Tracy Brothers and their various vehicles and those will be uh, available for the rest of the month so if you want to grab yours before the end of October, then um, well, now's the time. You'll also yeah. know that uh, Thunderbirds vs. the Hood and the TV21 audio annual Anything Can Happen are both out and shipped if you've uh, pre ordered or already ordered one. So, yes, look out for those. 
uh, I suspect Thunderbirds vs. The Hood may well be on its way to selling out. So if you do want a collector's physical edition, then grab it ASAP. Mm-hmm. Now, Friday seems to be very exciting at the moment. This Friday, we have another exciting announcement coming about something new. You might be able to guess what it is, given the month, possibly, if you know your Anderson history, but mm. I won't see any more than that for right. now. Okay, fair enough. Yes. Mm. Uh, another Anderson icon date. This Sunday, the end of the week, mm. happy birthday, Brian Blessed! Oh, oh really? <laughs> yes! Oh. It's Brian's birthday, oh, nice. so he is on Twitter, so do pop along and wish him a happy birthday from all Ander fans. Uh, yeah. And on a completely unrelated, different note, before anybody says I'm trying to be mean or something, uh, yeah. it's Halloween at the end of the month. Oh, of course it is. Yes, it is. Uh, yes. <laughs> and what better uh, costume than what? Zelda yep. from Terrorhawks? Oh, I was going to say, you haven't got a Brian Blessed mask, have you? <laughs> no, I have not got a oh. Brian Blessed mask. Oh, uh, maybe no. next year. The, our Zelda mask, which was supposed to be in for Halloween last year, is now available for Halloween this year so yeah, grab yours good. in plenty of time it's absolutely terrifying <laughs> perfect is. way to scare uh, loved ones um, disliked <laughs> ones uh, yeah. neighbours uh, mm-hmm. r- friends uh, strangers children. Yep. yes exactly um, it is pretty pr- pretty terrifying I've seen a great image that somebody sent in where they've dressed their Zelda mask to look like Zelda from the original series and it's very oh, convincing so yeah. if you have got one and you are dressing up for Halloween we would love to see uh, your very best Zelda Nice. Never thought I'd say that. Anyway, no. <laughs> there you go. There's more stuff going on. But I think that, for now, is the end of this week's Jerry Anderson News. That was the news. Quite spooky news. <laughs> well, we know, with Halloween around the corner and so on. Quite spooky news. When we do Quite that next spooky. time, you can do a spooky news. Oh, yeah. Why didn't I think of that? Can I, can I do it again now, or is it no, too do late? No, do it closer to the time. Oh, right, all right. Yes, Not I'll now. save it. I'll forget, of course, but I'll, I'll try and remember. Uh, now, uh... Are you on social media? Now, I know Facebook has a terrible rap, doesn't it? People get into all sorts of trouble on Facebook. And it's often, you know, a hive of of, of ill manners and and bad feeling. But I'll tell you one place you can go where you will be respected and welcomed with open arms. And that's the Jerry Anderson Podcast official listeners group. Lovely bunch of people. Very easy to join. Pop along to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash podsterons. Answer a few questions. We'll let you in and you can join in the fun. For example, Stu Gutteridge. Uh, well, he's jubilant as he says uh, Thunderbirds vs. the Hood and Anything Can Happen CDs have been dispatched. Just waiting on the concert Blu ray now, says Stu. So he's getting very excited. Uh, Mark Perkins says Re watching Anderson shows never fails to throw up surprises. This morning, I discovered that President Roberts, whom Spectrum were protecting from a Mr. on threat, lives in a slimmed down version of Lady Penelope's house. Mm. And he posted a couple of pictures side by side of uh, President uh, Roberts. Uh, well, I guess it's the White House, his residence, possibly, don't know, and uh, Lady Penelope's house. And indeed, it is the centre section without the wings that's obviously just been given a bit of a respray, yeah. and they've used that. Yes, good spot. Good bit of recycling there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Danny Hewson. Uh, I hope someone's gone up to him at some point in his life and says, Houston, we have a problem. Uh, but anyway, he says, hi, everyone. Hope you're all OK. Well, I'm so excited about the upcoming UFO technical manual. I went to bought the Space 1999 one in anticipation of its release. Lovely. He says, I love both shows and I'm so excited to have this in my hands. It really is something special. Now, all I need is the UFO manual to keep it company. Can you pre-order it from the Anderson store, he says. Well done and thanks to Jamie Anderson and all the people who worked on these books. Are the UFO comics strip books still available too? All the best from Danny. Uh, yes, Danny. Yes, yes, and yes. Yes, yes, yes and yes. yes. Absolutely. Very much yeah. yes. Yes. Of course you can pre-order it from the Jerry Anderson store. Scott Bickley got in touch to say, I've been to Norcon today to meet, guess who? Chris Barry. Oh, yeah, he says, uh, he says, I know he was on Red Dwarf, but from what I heard about him being the voice of Virgil Tracy from the Thunderbirds Pizza Hut advert back in 1993, he was so impressed that I told him who he voiced and he was pleased about it. And we talked about Thunderbirds and he remembered the characters and I showed him my Parker voice and he loved it. Bottom line, he says, uh, Scott, I got a print taken that I took a screenshot of, had it signed and also had a selfie done with him with my Virgil Tracy figure from Big Chief Studios. I think we can agree that Chris Barry is now part of the Anderverse, FAB. <laughs> well, <laughs> absolutely. Well, we know Chris is a fan. Again, yes. I still remember him trying to feed Brains uh, or Virgil a digest. No, Scott, trying to feed Scott uh, a digestive biscuit <laughs> yeah. at Brit Sci-Fi all those years ago. <laughs> 
That's right. Gosh, it was a long time ago. Mm. Uh, also on Facebook, we have the latest in the occasional series, Are We Living in a Jerry Anderson Universe? Because Alex K posted a link to a BBC article about the American space agency NASA crashing a probe into an asteroid, which uh, actually took place just today on uh, on day of recording. Uh, and the article says, in the coming hours, the American space agency will crash a probe into an asteroid. NASA's DART mission wants to see how difficult it would be to stop a sizable space rock from hitting Earth. The demonstration is taking place some 11 million kilometers away on a target called Dimorphos. The agency says the rock is not currently on path to hit the Earth, and nor will the test accidentally send it in our direction. Which is a relief. Phew, uh, they hope. Yes. Uh, telescopes will be watching from afar, including the super space observatory, James Webb. And Alex Kay posted that and says, I hope the Mistrons don't get any ideas. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's hope the Mistrons don't live on that, uh, on yeah. that space rock. <laughs> but that is one of those stories that we see every, you know, quite regularly, actually, where you just think, well, am I living in a Julie Anderson episode? Is this yeah. Captain Scarlet or, you know, something? Dave Bird finally got in touch to say, for any collectors of Torchy, I've just seen this in the Worcester comic shop called Out of This World, the Torchy Gift Book. It's priced £10, and the condition isn't too bad for 1960, although there's a little bit of writing on the inside pages. Mark Perkins commented underneath the picture, saying, I saw this in a bookshop once, but managed to resist. <laughs> yeah. I, I should imagine it was quite easy to resist, Mark, to be honest. But uh, Probably, you know, yeah. A nice find. Yeah, Can't nice imagine something. wrestling with himself that much. No, so there we are. Uh, but yes, do join in the fun over on our Facebook group. Lovely bunch of people. And uh, yes, it's still my ambition to get to a thousand members of the group by, by the new year. But uh, it's a tall order. So why not invite your friends too? Absolutely. Get more yeah. friends in, get them to listen. You uh, know, that's it. The exactly. more involved, the merrier, really. Quite right. Yeah, I'd have nothing to talk about otherwise, would I? <laughs> so, you know, exactly. It it's, helps me. You are an essential part, obviously, of the podcast. Yeah, podcast of course. So yeah. please get recruiting. Yeah, yeah. Richard James, would you yes. like some more Chris Bentley? I mean, who wouldn't oh. want more Chris Bentley? Yeah, bring it on. Well, that's lucky because I've got some more Chris Bentley for you. Hooray. Uh, Stingray saved his life, you know. Uh, yes. Now, Chris is a longtime fan and expert on all things Anderson, author of multiple books, as you know, including the complete book of Thunderbirds, the complete book of UFO, Captain Scarlet the Vault, Space 1999 the Vault, mm-hmm. the complete authorised Jerry Anderson guide, and many mm-hmm. more besides. He's a very nice man, lots of memories of Dad and thoughts on the shows, and I really enjoyed my chat with him. And here is part two of four. Wow. With Chris Bentley. Seeing as you've you've given a a mention and a callback to Super Mario Nation, I haven't really asked you kind of your entry point. (coughs) Excuse the dogs barking. I haven't really asked you your entry point into the worlds of Anderson. So where where does where did your Sort of jumping on point start. What what show was that, and when, and why did it captivate you? My first show was, strictly speaking, was Stingray, but I don't really remember it at the time. I mean, I was a tiny tot. I only know that I watched it because uh, my parents told me later. Um, there's a family <laughs> story about how at the time I was refusing to eat food. And they couldn't, they couldn't get anything. I mean, you know, I'm in, I'm still in a nappy in a, in a, you know, in a high chair, and they couldn't get spoons of muck into my gut. Not now, but you were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> and they, they actually went on for quite a while, and they got quite worried that you know I wasn't, I wasn't eating. They couldn't get me to eat, and uh, it was only by doing uh, sort of impressions of uh, Troy and Phones firing sting missiles. That uh, that my dad was able to get to fire spoonfuls of of uh, of mush into, into my mouth, uh, you know. The, 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 apparently, the you know the sound of my dad saying, you know, fire sting missiles, uh, that you know, just made me automatically open my mouth and allow him to put food in. So you could say Stingray <laughs> saved my life. I love but, that. No. That's we're going to stick with that as the title of this episode, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, no, actually, actually, when I remember watching the show, uh, we were living abroad until mid nineteen sixty seven, so we didn't have television. So the first thing I saw was Captain Scarlet. That was the first uh, the first Supermarination show that we had on television uh, in Yorkshire. Oh. We had a run of Thunderbirds early in in the first half of sixty eight. So I remember seeing seeing that a bit. Mm. But then um, the franchise changes happened in mid-1968 and Yorkshire Television took over our mm. area from Granada. 
and didn't show any supermarination shows at all then until 1976 when they did another run of, of Thunderbirds. So yeah, everybody else in the country was getting repeats of of uh, you know Fireball and Stingray and Thunderbirds and Captain Scarlet. We didn't get Joe 90. We didn't get the Secret Service. We didn't get repeats of any other shows. We did get UFO. Wow. We got the Protectors, and we got okay. Space 1999. So really, I was. I was more brought into your father's world with UFO. That was, you know, that was that mm. was a really big show for me at the time when we got it uh, in 1971. Don't really remember watching the Protectors. It wasn't really my thing uh, at that age. Um, Fair enough. So then, so then after UFO, it was, I mean, I love it now, but after UFO, it was mm. then Space 1999, and then Thunderbirds the following year when we got so- it in '76. I was going to say that's unusual, though, isn't it? That you get Thunderbird almost at the tail end of your key Anderson years. Mm. You, you know, if you can't remember Stingray, although it saved your life, uh, <laughs> but Scarlet and UFO are your big kind of entry points. The darker, the mm. the more threatening, the more kind of Cold Warry things hooked you. Do you mm. think you would have been as hooked if you'd seen and remembered Thunderbirds and Joe Ninety? The sort of well, not the Joe's twee, but you know what I mean. The the, cu- the, the cuter, the brighter, the, the less threatening. Do you think that would have captivated you as much? Oh, yes, because it wasn't... Uh, I don't think... I mean, even, you know, when, when I first saw UFO in 71, I mean, in in 67, when I saw Scarlet, I was only just four. So I didn't... I wouldn't <laughs> have had a clue what was going on. It was just the visuals, really, that mm. I, you know, that, that were grabbing my attention, uh, you know, the... The cars yeah. and the and the, the the uniforms and so on the bright. Well, I was going to say the bright colours, but of course it was black and white television, so we didn't have any any bright colours. <laughs> so it was it was, it, it was literally just the, the varied you know, the greys, the greys, yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, so it was just the design of the vehicles and the look of the costumes and so on. Uh, I suppose really as I was responding to at that time with UFO, I was a bit older by then. I think I was picking up on. I could I could understand mostly what was going going on. I guess episodes like Confetti Check A OK probably didn't do anything for me, but I do particularly remember I was very very fond at the time of uh, there's an episode called Reflections in the Water where they they find an alien dome under the sea and there are doubles there um, ready to take over Shadow HQ and that one particularly fired my imagination you know i wrote about it in the in, in my exercise book at school the next day you know and drew a picture <laughs> of the dome and so on and, and so yeah and and it's still a favorite you know it's just something about that you know obviously the submarine and you know they were fighting in the dome and so on and uh, so it, i guess what i'm saying is it wasn't really it wasn't really that the darkness particularly that i was a ch- that, that that was drawing me in it was more the visual look of the things and i'm sure if i'd seen if i'd yeah. seen joe 90 and, and thunderbirds earlier than i did uh, they would have grabbed my attention you know just as much i mean i was aware of them because yeah. they were strips in countdown comic um mm. and i got i got countdown in mainly for doctor who and ufo that were that were both in it but yeah. that was really my introduction to the concepts of Thunderbirds and Stingray and Fireball XL5 and Captain Scarlet because they were, you know, there were yeah. strips in the comic. I love the varied ways in which people kind of find their way into Anderson stuff and through different ones. I mean, I, I, you know, I've not heard a Scarlet UFO and then comics and Thunderbirds later kind of chronology before, but it's just another example of all the different ways because of the repeats and because of mm-hmm. the kind of... the the timeless appeal, I guess. And UFO that I'm going to say set you on your Anderson writing journey. If you started writing about in your exercise book at school, (laughs) but how, how did that then kind of take you from kid who's enjoying these shows and your imaginations being fired by them to ending up writing professionally about these shows over many, many years uh, and to, to the to the chairmanship of the the club, what was the kind of the trajectory to get there? Well, I suppose it was. I, I started to get involved in other areas of fandom in the in the late eighties. I wasn't wasn't mm. really really involved in. I mean, I kept up an interest in the shows. I started buying 
SIG magazine uh, in the mid eighties, yeah. which uh, which kind of really sort of got me interested in in your father's work again after a long period of of not really seeing it, seeing anything much simply because it wasn't on the telly then the the videos started coming out sell through videos of the um the super space theater films seeing those yeah. again and then the shows eventually coming back on television we finally got joe 90 in 1983 in yorkshire that was a, the, the first time <laughs> it was broadcast here so i got to see that and loved it but yes, towards the end of the eighties, there'd been a run on uh, a fresh run of UFO, and that had really, you know, fired me up. I wanted to know more about it. Started going to conventions, mm. started becoming involved with Fanderson and helping out with uh, doing graphics and so on because I was I was actually uh, working as a graphic designer at the time. Uh, I'd done mm. uh, done a. a, a Art, uh, art and design at college. So that was my career. I wasn't really doing any writing. And um, one of the people I got to know uh, through helping out with the club was uh, a lad called Neil Swain, who was at that time the chairman of Fanderson. And I got on very well with Neil. Yeah. He was very, you know, a very affable bloke. And uh, his, his particular things were Space 1999 and Fireball XL5. He was very, very keen on both of those shows. And um, he set up a, he was instrumental in setting up a, a small Space 1999 convention here in Leeds. And uh, I got involved with that, doing designing logos and posters and various bits of graphics that they needed. And then... Tragi tragically, in the summer of 1990, Neil fell off a balcony in Spain and died. Mm. And the club was without a chairman. I mean, it was, you know, it was unbelievable, really. You know, we had one of those situations where we came to, there was a mailing for the club. We had to mail out the latest issue of Fanderson News, as it was called at the time. And I pitched up at this mailing, and everybody else was sitting in the in the room, you know, really solemn. They'd only just found out that that uh, that Neil had died, and I came barging in and said something like, "You know, you'll look like somebody's died," you know, and of course, you know, terribly <laughs> oh, embarrassing. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> and uh, because he really had, and it was it was it was very shocking. Uh, but the club needed a chairman, and uh, I thought, well. I knew what Neil wanted to do with the club because he sort of like had started this initiative, mm. you know, really trying to improve the quality of it. Uh, I knew the direction he yeah. wanted to wanted to take it in, and so I thought, well, I can, I could, I could pick up the baton here if they give me a chance, and carry on, you know, with the direction that Neil wanted to take it in. So, in a sense, it was you know out of a sort of like friendship and and and, and loyalty to Neil that I I wanted then to become involved, and um, mm. fortunately the the uh, the majority of the members of the the committee, as it was then, th thought that I was the right person to take it on at that time, and so I became I became club chairman, and um, mm. uh, we did the we did the AlphaCon convention in Leeds in Neil's honour. And uh, I kind of like, you know, stepped into his shoes a little bit then, but then didn't actually become chairman until the following year. And it, it went from there because mm. I then became involved in writing the club magazine or writing parts of it or writing and editing parts of it. And so, you know, increasingly I, I started doing writing work. And then in 2000, and, 2000, 2001, 2000, I think it was the um, there was another run of mm. Thunderbirds on the BBC and um, Carlton, uh, who owned the rights to it at that time, had done a, a, a had done a digital remaster of it for DVD, and so there was a huge launch yeah. coming up that year where they were launching the show on DVD and it was going to be shown on uh, on the BBC, and. Um, Oh, that was the point at which they added started adding sound effects. They added some sound effects to the to the uh, to the soundtrack, so that they could sp split the channels and make it all five point one surround, um, which there was a lot of uh, lot of disagreement about at the time. 
but yeah, as sort of like part, some of the the, uh, the tie-in merchandising, they wanted a diff, like a, a, a sort of a tie tie-in book, a companion to Thunderbirds, uh, which they wanted to call mm. the complete book of Thunderbirds. And uh, I'd just written a, a serialized piece for Fab, which was the club magazine, about the making of Thunderbirds, and they said, "Could I adapt that and you know turn it into a book?" And uh, you know, I had a lot of other. Obviously, I had to add a lot of other material. I hadn't written that much, yeah. but it was made made a whole book. Um, and they said, uh, "Would you like to do that?" I said, "Would I?" And uh, and they said, "Can you do it in six <laughs> weeks?" And oh. uh, yeah, and so I thought, "Well, I don't know. I'll give it a go." <laughs> And uh, yeah, somehow I I wow. did manage it. I you know to go from go from six six weeks from writing complete book of Thunderburst to two years to writing Space nineteen ninety nine the Vault was a con- bit of a considerable difference. But uh, I think it shows in the final <laughs> product. But yeah, that was my first thing, Thunderbirds. The, the, the complete book of Thunderbirds, which was you know, it was it was it was exciting and uh, and uh, that was. Oh, that was that was funny. We had a a, a launch for that at Harrods. Uh, Harrods mm. decided to do a Thunderbirds Day at the time yep. that the, the screening started, and uh, your your dad came along and was was doing like signing signing all sorts of stuff. You know, the merchandise that was coming out. It wasn't just my book, uh, and uh, I was there. And Graham Bleethman was there. He had a Cutaways book that he'd done, and so we were both there to sign our our respective books and uh when i got there the uh the lady at harrods uh said oh uh all right you 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 stay here she put me in a room she said stay here and we'll come and get you when we're ready for you and i sat there and i sat there i must have been there about three quarters of an hour and then somebody else walked in and said oh who are you so i I said who i was and she said oh uh, yeah, oh, you should have been out there about you know half an hour ago. Uh, you know, we've sold all the books, <laughs> so, oh, no. so so I've gone all the way to, all the way to Harrods, uh, come down from come down from Leeds and gone to, to, to for this, especially for this signing. And um, amazing, yeah, yeah. Before I could before I could even pick up a pen, they'd sold all the bloody things, and there was nothing for me to do. So this. <laughs> <laughs> they sat me at a they sat me at a little table uh, with a a, a a kind of a uh, I don't know like a little notice with my name on it and expected me to sign compliment slips Harrods compliment slips if people wanted them and I sat there for an hour and not a single person wanted a compliment slip with my a Harrods compliment slip oh, with my name on it <laughs> but quite a few people did ask me directions <laughs> to different departments in Harrods. Because they they thought I was Brilliant. I was the you know I was the um, I was the <laughs> a local member of staff the the the, uh, the information guy or something. Anyway, at I, least you're a pointed for the day then. <laughs> well, probably not because I I pointed people off into different directions and sent them to different floors and I had no idea where anything was. So whether anybody anybody found the underwear department or or, or furniture, I don't know. Uh. But yeah, Brilliant. your dad was really in his element. He, was, he had a whale of a time signing stuff, and of course, you know, people just adored him. Uh, you know, the crowds and crowds of people yeah. flocking around him all the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Isn't I, that's that? I mean, I'm sorry that that was such a terrible experience for you, <laughs> but but it does it does illustrate something really interesting for me. And maybe you know, I've tried to understand the kind of the dichotomy of what I saw about dad, which is on the one hand. He was not nostalgic for his own output and he would look back and find faults and complain about visibility of wires or, you know, uh, the, the, the poor mobility of, of puppets or the difficulties of working with actors. or what, It was always things that he would look back and go, oh, I'm not that happy. So he kind of never really reveled in his own creation. And yet, in those circumstances where people were there saying all these lovely things, even though we know that he kind of disagreed with them about what they thought about it compared to his view, he he really sort of took to it. So, I mean, do, 
a lot of people have asked me if he was kind of ever satisfied or happy with his shows and talking to him directly you'd say no but seeing him in that situation you'd say yes so uh, what 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 is it which, which of those is he or was was he both of those things i think it's a there's a well yeah both yeah there's an interesting thing that happens uh, and you must be aware of it yourself that when you're actually involved in television or film production i think it's very difficult to actually assess whether something that's that you've made uh when it when it finally comes even well i mean obviously while it's filming you've no idea how it's going to come out but even when it's finished mm. i think it's difficult because you're so close to it you've often seen the thing what probably i don't know 15 20 30 <laughs> times before you've finally too many you know, times it, yeah, before you're finally done with it, and so uh, individual fil- uh, you know filmmakers, I can understand why they 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 find it very difficult to assess the value of their own work, and I'm sure that was that was the same with your father. He could only assess it really in terms of seeing people enjoying it, and I think that's why he liked coming to conventions because uh, not I'm sure not so much. Uh, because he enjoyed the adulation, because that was my impression that your father was actually quite a shy bloke who didn't, mm, uh, nice, you know, didn't really, um, didn't really take to uh, the idea of a celebrity. But actually, seeing people, you know, large, you know, we would have five hundred people sat in a in a hotel conference room watching episodes of his shows, and you know, laughing and enjoying them and clapping them and so on. <laughs> I mean, we did. You know, we did previews of some episodes of Space Precinct at uh, at a convention in the sort of like mid nineties, and you know, I think that was he 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 felt that was absolutely vital because he you know he could see where he could see where it was working. He could see how people were enjoy whether they were enjoying it or not. Um, and the same with same with Lavender Castle. We did something similar there in uh, I think in nineteen ninety eight where mm. he previewed some episodes before they'd been shown on television for us. And he, you know, he, he enjoyed seeing how people were enjoying his programs, even if he couldn't <laughs> enjoy them himself, or, or perhaps understand yeah. why people were finding them enjoyable. And you know, uh, I'm sure you've heard him said say many times that you know, if he knew why his shows were successful or why a particular show worked or didn't, you know, he'd have been a he'd have been a very rich man because he would have been able to turn out you know successful shows all the time. But I think I think with Thunderbirds he recognised that really had somehow lightning you know lightning in a bottle was, was something something about it that had really really caught on with the with the imagination the public imagination and continued to do obviously through into the through into this century so um, yeah still still going all ages it's being handed down and it's still there. More Chris Bentley coming soon, and if you want to find Chris on social media, you can't. Oh, really? No, he doesn't really do social media no, very much. Found. No, no, he just Fair doesn't enough. get involved. He's not interested in it. So yeah, you know, he just lets his work do the talking, doesn't he? I mean, that's uh, exactly, and his voice in this case. So <laughs> yeah, true. A, a great honour to have the other half of the bit of Chris that does the talking. <laughs> what? You know, his work and his voice. We, you know. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah, I see. I was following on from what you'd said. Yeah, it's just got. Yeah, it's quite confusing. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, just give me a second. I've got a really clammy ear today uh, under the, the headphones. So I'm just going to give it a, oh. a little fan. I don't think we need to know. Now, I'd, I'd like to ask then: Is that a sign of something? Is you know, the more interesting the podcast, the clammier the ear, because you're kind of listening more, or you're more involved, or I what, mean, what? It, it could, could well be, be that. Yeah. I, I've never thought about it. Well, let's see what happens. Uh, what do you think, Posturons? Is this a particularly interesting podcast? And therefore, is my clammy ear justified? Don't, don't ask them that. <laughs> I mean, that's a whole that's a hornet's nest right there. Yeah, okay. Is this an interesting podcast? F- forget I ever said that and forget so, my clammy ear. Oh, Moving on, Richard. What's coming yeah. next? Have you got something Skating to distract us with? Be nice. Yes, I have. Actually. Quick, something else. Hurry, mm. hurry, hurry. <laughs> now, over on Twitter, uh, thankfully, people have been hashtagging us, uh, Jerry Anderson Podcast. They've been tagging me, Richard M. James, him over there, I'm Jamie Anderson. And him over there, waiting uh, patiently in the wings with his big red button, Chris Dalek. Keith Gooch on Twitter says, on this week's podcast, you asked, what is the best Jerry Anderson-related present you ever received? 
received. Well, he says, I would just like to thank everyone at the Jerry Anderson store for getting these two beauties for me today. That's got to be the best birthday present ever. Now, uh, I neglected to make a note of the pictures that he posted, but I think one of them was uh, a standby for... Oh, I don't no, know. No, it was the uh, it was TV 21 audio annual. Yes, Anything okay. can happen. And it was Thunderbirds versus The Hood, the two releases uh, that well came out done. last week that we shipped just ahead of yep. uh, intended release date uh, for those who've been waiting on pre-orders for a while. Good, good. So happy birthday to Keith. Uh, Peach says, My favourite ever and a present, definitely Tracy Island, now 30 years old, this Christmas, I think. She says the island, not me, sadly. Still got it. I just can't reach it safely at the moment. Which makes me wonder, oh dear, is uh, time taking its toll on the old back and you can't quite reach up to the top shelf to get Aww. it down? Mm. Uh, anyway, uh, Mike Tharm has found his Space Precinct Pogs. Hooray! Hooray! Uh, he said it's taken me a while, but I finally found mine in a tin box buried in the attic. Probably the best place for them, to be honest. Uh, Short James, the watcher, says, Now for the final two episodes of Jerry Anderson's UFO, Time Lash and The Long Sleep. I really enjoyed watching this brilliant science fiction series. The stories, acting and special effects have made for excellent viewing. So, there's a lot of love for UFO out there. We know that. Yes, as as there should be, as there should be. Yes. Comedy Club for Kids, talking about a lot of love for Jerry Anderson shows, says, happy to report that the Secret Service Jerry Anderson's short-lived TV series about Father Stanley Unwin foiling plots against Britain by being a priest with a shrink ray is A, all on YouTube, and B, bonkers good. <laughs> That's well, perfect, isn't it? That it? It A, shouldn't all be on YouTube. Right. Uh, and B, is bonkers good. Yes, OK. Yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah, sorry, yeah. We'll, we'll gloss over that then. Exactly, uh, I'm ignoring it, it's fine. <laughs> Contemplative Politics talks about the, uh, the NASA uh, probe smashing into the asteroid today. Should we get international rescue and specifically Thunderbird 3 on standby, just in case? Uh, they say, on the plus side, this is at last the Jerry Anderson future I was promised as a kid. It's true, it's slightly disappointing not to be living in that world, isn't it, in 2022. Mm. So any little sort of window into it, like uh, today's news, is, uh, is always very welcome. All helps a little bit, yes. It does. And here's a nice one. Now, Michael tweeted uh, Talking Picks TV, which is a uh, channel over here showing old uh, TV programmes and films. And they showed a 1948 film called Snowbound, starring Herbert Long. So Michael tweeted them saying, I love it when you show films that my granddad, Charles Knott, worked on. In this case, as supervising editor, whatever that is. Uh, Michael says, according to IMDb, his assistant on this film was Jerry Anderson, who oh. went on to make Stingray, Thunderbirds, and many others. Interesting. I didn't know he so did Snowbound. 1948 with uh, with Har- Herbert Long. Yeah, Snowbound, uh, where he was apparently the assistant to the supervising editor. Oh, there you go. Wow, amazing. It's great when you could tell the son of Jerry Anderson something about Jerry Anderson that he didn't know, <laughs> isn't it? It's rare, it is. but it happens. I mean, uh, yes, I'm just looking, I'm, I'm looking on IMDb now. It's absolutely yeah. right there. I just, I wasn't Lovely. one that I was familiar with. There's other ones like The Wicked sure. Lady and Caravan that are, kind of ring a bell, but that wasn't one. Okay. Amazing. Right. Nice. Uh, yeah, all for now, but yes, do tag us on uh, Twitter, hashtag Jerry Anderson Podcast, and tag our various names. You know them by now. Uh, I'll see your tweets and I'll read them out next time. Great. Now. Yeah. This yes. is the bit that I've been told off for previously. So right, very on, shortly, right. Chris mm-hmm. Dale will be doing the randomizer. Mm-hmm. He will right. somehow achieve activation of the randomizer via a variety of methods, be okay. they pressing it himself, finding they? somebody else to press it, it yeah. happening to activate itself automatically, <laughs> right. or happen. somebody else or some other device randomly or not randomly choosing yes. an episode or That's feature. It. Exactly. So why don't you say that every week? I mean, it's not a snappy. It's granted, so it's pretty catchy, though. So I'll yeah, say that yeah. all in future. <laughs> so here is probably Chris Dale with one of those things for yes. the randomizer. It doesn't really work, does it? Not as well, no. Uh, Tricord is happy. That's it then, Marina. Looks like the software upgrade is installed nicely, so we should be able to make this week's selection now. Oh, then I've come at the right time to witness your success. Oh, more than that, Patrick. You can press the button if you'd like. I just installed an upgrade that should make it run a bit more smoothly. You continue to solve every problem except the basic one. You keep failing. Oh, no. No, it's been mostly good stuff recently. You just have to have faith. Oh, I have a different faith than yours. A more certain knowledge of what is to be and what is not to be. Oh, well, if you already know what the randomizer is going to pick, then 
why are you here? You lack faith in my judgment? Yeah, see, Marina? Reverse psychology. You can't beat it. To your offense, quackery is no substitute for the true faith. Only faith can outface death. Um, yes, well, I think that might be asking a bit much of the randomizer, Patrick. So, what have we got today? A revelation. I've seen the future for us all. I, yes, if I could perhaps just have a look at the selection? Ah, okay, well, yes, this definitely is a revelation. We're heading back over to Marineville for a very good episode of Stingray. So are they all. Oh, yes, but this one's extra special. Here's Titan Goes Pop. Then our job should be done. I wish you'd go pop. If you look closely, you'll find I've wired myself as a human explosive. Oh, really? Not again. Stingray! So we welcome back to the randomizer. It's Stingray. We've had quite a bit of Stingray recently, and quite right too, with these lovely new Blu-rays. And uh, you know, just yesterday I was putting the the finishing edits to the randomizer for the Terrorhawks episode Runaway. And now, and now, there's a dead puppet in the background there. In the new fabulous, I praised Runaway for being uh, a simple story with a very comedic edge, and here we have Stingray doing much the same with Titan Goes Pop and this wonderful pop star, Duke Dexter. And oh my goodness, I love, I just love the look of this character. I love that he's not like conventionally hunky in the same way that say Johnny Swoonara was. Ever since last. But he is, I've always wondered if this is Commander Zero, by the way, draped over this television camera. It could be, maybe not. He's wearing a cardigan that I don't think Commander Zero would be seen dead in. But yeah, this guy has, is a bit more pretty boy than Johnny Swoonara was, which kind of suits him. And uh, we have this very catchy song, actually. Uh, another catchy song, which I, I was recently surprised to hear. Well, not recently, a few years ago. To see Ray Barrett's name credited for singing this song. And I, at the time, I couldn't hear it as Ray, but now I think I do. And it's a very nice, it's got a very nice sound to that, that voice, the singing voice. Because he was a singer, as, as many of the Anderson voice artists were during the Super Mario Nation period. And he's such a... A forceful presence on stage that that amp that's uh, putting out the sound of his guitar is smouldering because he's just so hot and so cool and you can hear those girls you can't see them but you can hear them and it's it's just lovely to see Stingray there goes the amp yeah just see lovely to see Stingray looking at pop culture trends of the time and the name of thunder was that he sounded like a wounded whatever you I love that line <laughs> And this thing since the first man on the moon. He should have been the first man on the moon. <laughs> yeah, Duke Dexter's news. Oh dear. Right. And uh, Phones has got a killer line here as well. When he was playing in Denver, my little niece managed to get a bit of his jacket. The fans just ripped it right off of him. What for? Well, I never did figure that out, but I just thought I'd tell you. <laughs> Phones just wants to participate. But again, it's lovely to see the show looking at contemporary pop artists and pop culture and drawing inspiration for a story from it. Now we all know. And of course you think, well, how can you fit a pop star into Marineville? Duke is unlikely to cross our path. And it's great that the Stingray characters are clearly thinking the same. Meanwhile, here's a familiar face. This uh, dispatch rider racing to Marineville. It's the Lieutenant Mizen puppet from Marineville Traitor, which was, uh, I think... Would have been about seven episodes earlier. Oh, there's a rare sight. So it's nice to see that he's been let out. Uh, he's working off his, his sentence um, by being a dispatch rider. Uh, mostly against a, a rear projection screen here, which has a lovely pan through the, the streets of Marineville, which you don't always get to see as a pan past the hospital. Some bad news for Commander Shaw. Not only is Lieutenant Meisen back, but... Yes, sir? I've been summoned to headquarters. Ooh. It's a top security matter. Oh, yes, he doesn't know yet. This is clever as well, because we're led to... Well, certainly the characters are led to believe this is something serious. We've got to use you know, maximum security, VIP helicopter, I think. Is this the bit where Fisher is tapping out Morse? Uh, a, a new Morse code that X20 can't crack? A sure special helicopter. There's no doubt about it. I'm really on to something big. It's a good thing I managed to put cameras in every building in Marineville. When did I find time to do that? Oh, but I, I love this side of X20. 
But it would take me months to break this code. We, we get the impression he is genuinely... If only I knew what all this was about. Uh, ...conducting proper surveillance off screen. He's not a total buffoon. He is actually doing the work. Dexter. Mander, please. Try and keep your voice down. This must not leak out. And here we have the, uh, the WASP commander, or the World Security Patrol. Okay, Jim. Thank you, sir. Officers. So quite simple. I think this is the first time we've seen them on the randomizer. This guy, oh, I've always thought, looks like a frog. Agreed to appear in a show direct from Marineville. But it was interesting that every time they turned up, Manager said that the they'd all swapped voices. And we must bear full responsibility. And sometimes, I think there was one, an episode, it might even be the first one, where to the problem. one of these characters changes voice during the course of the episode. Utmost secrecy. Just as it's been handled so far. Unless we keep this matter to ourselves... You could have a thousand screaming kids at the gates of Marineville. Don't worry, sir. So... You'll have Duke Dexter in and out of Marineville before... Duke's coming to Marineville to put on a show. And the news has got out. And, yeah, the Marineville Observer. I noticed that there's a hand covering a part of the... I don't know, some goings-on in Slough. My great cunning. And more great comedy here. Oh, the experience I have gained working as a surface agent... I have discovered that Duke Dexter is coming to Marineville. Excellent! Excellent! How did you find out? Well, I read it in the newspaper. Brilliant! So, <laughs> Duke Dexter is coming to Marineville. Who is Duke Dexter? And it's a great way to use these characters. I think, firstly, I like the humour here that... A secret measure. You get the impression Titan doesn't know as much about what's going on on the surface world as X-20 clearly does, having you know, lived there. I want Duke Dexter here, in Titanica. But what they end up doing, hatching this plan, they just know that this guy is important. They don't know why, but they must have him. It's very in keeping with the characters. For once, you've got humour in Stingray, which isn't really sending up the characters. Main gate requesting extra men. They're all they're, they're thoroughly Double strength now, sir. The characters are, are playing it totally straight. Even the aliens, I think that's what makes it work. Ridiculous, Marineville surrounded. Well, Duke, as your manager, I know you're crazy about this Marineville show. That's, that's right, Sandy. I uh, <laughs> I just want to help out with this. Um... Recruiting drive for the for the wasps. Uh, hmm. it's, it's interesting as well. He's there for to help with the the wasp recruiting drive. The Marineville, isn't he, Atlanta? Today. I think we've got. I think if you actually went through Stingray episodes, you could probably only come up with like ten wasp personnel throughout the whole course of the series. So yes, I think they need all the help they can get here. Maybe they could build some more ships afterwards as well, aside from the just one. And here's X20 in makeup, wearing a badge saying, I love Duke. Okay, that's near enough, mister. Here's my pass, Sergeant. Oh, oh Mr. Gibson. Yes, sir, we're expecting you. Say. And here's the security guard. It, this guy was, was a, again, a common fixture of. Well, that guy over there told. The, the latter half of the series, I think. But he also changed his voice, even though he, he was always a security guard, often seen at the main gate. But, um. Yeah, often change the voice. Stay right where you are, mister. There's no need for that attitude, Sergeant. I am X of special security. Here's my pass. <laughs> Which I'll show you for a few seconds, or less than a second, and then pull it away. Get him back, Sergeant. Be on guard. I'm off to see the commander. And I love X-20's total unrestricted access to Marineville. To the gates! They're coming back! Which we saw in multiple episodes. It's so silly, but it uh, it's just lovely to see him walk right through the main gate as if he just owns the place. Aren't you the guy I saw? I am X of special security, Mr. Gibson. You're to make no move until I give you the say-so. Well, sure, but uh, this is a bit unusual. Well, a visit from Duke Dexter is on you. <laughs> it's just that badge. It's not even I love Duke. It's I like Duke. He studied... How a, a pop fan would look and the things they might do, but he hasn't quite got it. And that's beautiful. It's, you know, he's he's not of this world, so it makes sense for him to not quite get what any of this is about. For people that know I'm around, the better. If anybody wants to know, tell them I'm your assistant. Now, about Commander Shaw, this is what I suggest you do. You want to see my identity papers? This is fun as well. 
that X20 puts the idea in, uh, in what's this guy's name? Sandy? His manager, um, Duke's manager's head, that uh, we have to have maximum security. And sure, it's just given up by this point. And I remember this episode, it kind of feels like a series finale to me. And it only feels that way because when I first saw the show, you all know where I first saw the show, it was on the BBC repeats in the early 90s, in the Friday night slot. This was the final episode they showed. We need a decoy. They they still had about a dozen left, but they just stopped at this point on the Friday night showings. And then much later they, they showed the remaining episodes on Sundays. And I wasn't aware that they were being shown on Sundays until they were almost all gone. Little job he's got. So it really felt like this was the last episode. Which of course it wasn't, thankfully. And here's poor old Troy being pressed into service. This is it's a it's a beautifully terrible shot of Troy running in inverted commas uh, away from the fans in front of the back projection screen again of the streets of Marineville while well, Duke is uh, brought in by helicopter landing on a helipad which seems to be in front of the old Black Rock Laboratory shortly before it was destroyed for the opening titles of Thunderbirds should be coming through the main gate any minute now and creating the diversion diversion Oh, I love this shot of Troy. It's just so... It, just, it doesn't work at all. It's brilliantly terrible. Captain Tempest is being mobbed. Hey, keep out of here. Watch out! I also love that you have Don Mason reporting that Troy is under attack in a voice that's very similar to Troy. Enjoy the trip. Ah, it's great. Almost as if Troy has grabbed a microphone and is referring to himself as Troy Tempest. There he is. Hey, I always thought fans liked their idol. Well, he's picked up kisses from at least three girls. Ordinarily, Troy wouldn't Go do. object to that, but... You see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, great. At least we know nothing can go wrong in Marineville. Uh-oh, he said it. He said it. Yes, Marineville is surrounded by screaming girls. And it's all going to plan for X20. <laughs> And I do find as I get older that episodes like this I do appreciate more because when I think of humour in Stingray I kind of think it leans more towards the sort of wah wah and the talking fish and just end of episode comedy lines that aren't really that funny. I, I as you probably know, I, I appreciate the humour that started to creep in with Joe 90 and the Secret Service and definitely with Terror Hawks, which I guess is all you know, to a large extent Tony Barwick. I really like that level of humour. So it's great when you get earlier episodes well, pre-Barwick that I'll go and finish up. just capture that spirit of comedy that doesn't so reduce the characters or reduce the show to a joke. This is all played dead serious. Stingray has just abandoned a duke on the island of Lemoy. Again, nobody questions why so many people with the voice of Peter Lorre operate out of this house on Lemoy. Ding, ding. <laughs> Isn't Stingray a beaut? I, I, I'd give anything to have a crate like that myself. Yes, they've left him uh, Thanks, on the island for maximum security. The fans can't get him there. No, I've had a meal prepared. He must be hungry. Yeah, yeah. You can say that again. Oh, it's a slice of bread, some orange juice, and the fruit bowl. Ah, orange juice that looks a bit cloudy. The music says it's a bit suspicious. And here's a random element in the story that uh, is a bit surprising. Opening ocean door. Hey, hey, what, what's happened? Well, what is it? Stingray just breaks down. And I can't think of many outside of uh, Space 1999, obviously the multiple eagle crashes. You don't get many episodes where the, the star vehicle just breaks. Uh, unless it's been sabotaged or it's been forced to crash or something. Oh, we're in trouble. You always think, oh, XL5 and Supercar and Stingray, it's like you know, nothing can take them down and here it's just broken of its own accord. Taking you on a little sea trip. My plan worked better than I dared hope. <laughs> There's a fault. I love how surprised he sounds. He actually did something right for once. Look, could we have some quiet, you guys? I can't hear what the TV producer's saying. Oh. You know what these radio phones are like? Oh, yes, yeah, a radio phone. It's a regular phone with uh, a very crude radio yeah. transmitter sort of glued to it. About it. Bye. It's quite a bulky prop. Hey, uh, hold it another couple of minutes. 
Hey, you guys, I, I gotta make another call. Oh, please go right ahead. Don't let us get in your way. Oh, it's okay. You can stick around. <laughs> Again, it's just that that's a great example. The characters are being very true to themselves. Shaw is irate that this guy is coming and just taken over. And uh, was it Sandy? I, I'm having trouble remembering the name there. He's just oblivious to anything except Duke. But of course, he can't get through to Lemoy because there is no one on Lemoy. X20, still in his uh, Duke fanboy disguise, has captured. How a wonderful pop star. No answer. Something must have happened. Check the line. Yeah, I checked. And now I want immediate action. Okay, okay. Phones? Yes, sir? Will that circuit hold up long enough to get Stingray to Lemoy? Well, it'll take us that far, but not out to open sea. That's all I wanted to know. Stand by to launch Stingray. Hmm. Again, because they have no other ships, they have to send out this ship that uh, at the moment is proving a bit unreliable. They do have helicopters, but hey-ho, we've got to get some use out of the uh, the title vehicle this week. It's not going to be used for much else otherwise in a, a story about pop stars. We've had some crazy situations, but this one beats them all. It's crazy, all right. But have you thought about what would happen to me if anything did happen to Duke Dexter? Why, no. What would happen? Oh, it's a gorgeous shot of Stingray moored next to the island. The place is empty. But Duke! What's happened to Duke? I just noticed the fruit in the fruit bowl. It actually looks quite mouldy now. Again, nobody questions all the mysterious goings on in Lemoy. I love it. <laughs> it's just so lovely. And I love that X20 is actually getting away with it for once. In, in approximately one hour with Duke Dexter. Oh. And I, I'm looking at the Duke puppet there and wondering... Hey, one unidentified craft in the area, sir. ...if he's modelled on any specific pop star. Order Stingray to win. I got the impression that there's a bit of uh, Tom Jones in the face and also in the leg movements when he was dancing earlier. Stingray from Tower. Intercept unidentified craft at South Southwest 1100, reference 8. <laughs> I love that, that Sandy keeps checking his watch. I've got to get back in time for the show. It's, there it is again. Approach with caution. Duke Dexter could be on board. And I think they just played there the uh, the old Star Trek card of uh, Stingray's the only ship in the area. Stingray's the only ship, period. Um, that's why I, I love in the, the TV21 comics, as much as I love the show, I love in the, the comics they were, able, they were able to build up the wasps a bit more. They had that wonderful carrier, the Sea Leopard, which I would have loved to have seen on the show. But obviously Stingray is, is awesome. And we only have so many puppets to man so many vehicles. It's not much of a chase scene here, though, because I think this all uh, is all pieced together from stock footage, the model shots, anyway. Puppet footage, everyone's just looking a bit nervous. It's an in on her fast. Yeah. Stock footage, stock footage. Ooh. Sage in X20 to Titanica, approaching you from the south. That's a very cool shot, though, of uh, X20 sub passing that outer. I don't know what it is, a sort of a security checkpoint outside Titanica. Sometimes there was a close up shot of it. It almost looks like a fish. Very nice building. I'm not sure if that was stock footage or if that was made for the show. This episode specifically, I mean. Completely. But now Stingray is thoroughly knackered. And again, I love this shot of it sinking with the, the real fish in front of it. It's quite a close shot, and the fish are... Well, they're, they're a bit panicked by this, as, as well they might be. Also love the, the puppets wiggling the controls around as if that's going to do anything. They can barely see for all the smoke that's on that set now. And here we go! X20 has succeeded! Duke Dexter is in Titanica! Well, surface agent X20, wait outside. I will question the prisoner. You have earned a sticker. A well done sticker. You and I are going to have a little talk. Oh, and I love as well that we get so close to the end of the episode before we get back to Titan and what he thinks is actually going on. Breaking down. Because as we discover in a moment, he doesn't really know and he has a private conversation with Duke just to figure out who are you? Why are you important? I understand, sir. I never thought when that pop idol arrived here that my whole career would depend on him. 
A very interesting story. Yeah, what the... Well, I... I, I also love that um, Duke it seems completely clueless about everything, so he's particularly out of his depth here. It is true, isn't it, that whenever you stand up in front of people, they scream at you? <laughs> oh, well, yeah. Yeah, 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 I guess so. And it is true, is it not, that if you are seen walking down the street, people chase you and attack you and tear every piece of clothing from your back? Oh, <laughs> well, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. It's brilliant. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. It's one of my favourite bits of Stingray, this. Mediterraneans, I couldn't do better myself. Keep up the good work. <laughs> you are on our side. After all that, he just brings him down to give him a pat on the back and say, well done. Octopus juice. Because he doesn't understand. He can't understand. My special guest, Mr. Dexter. He, he can only go by what he's observed with his own eyes. I shall return. And try to filter it through his own worldview. It's so brilliant. It's such a fantastic way to use these characters. Next to zero. But one thing is certain. This Duke Dexter is on our side. And it's lovely to see Titan respond to someone so positively. Be so welcoming to them. He is. I have ordered him to drink our special potion that will drug him until you return him back to the Terranians. And he genuinely thinks this guy is not only an ally, he probably thinks he's a friend. He's like a kindred spirit. Well, I'm glad you made it back. Oh, I love it. That's one of my favourite moments of the whole series is Titan's response to Duke Dexter. Just magical stuff. I got your message that Duke Dexter had been found back at Lemoy. Sure was a relief. Well, Dexter came up with some fantastic story about being captured under the sea. So I just put it down to a drug-fueled bender. These pop stars go on those, you know. Well, I guess the whole thing was a publicity stunt. Probably all part of the setup. Again, brilliant. A brilliant way to explain it within the story. Big show tonight. Then... It's such an outlandish concept, and yet every single step of it, with the possible exception of Stingray breaking down, which is just to sort of sideline them from a bit, it all works, it all fits the established world of the show. And here we are. I think I spot Professor Matic in the audience here. Um, yeah, that's him all right. And again, it's it's obvious we've got we've only got so many puppets and we've only got so many puppeteers. So some of the puppets in the background look a bit dead. Also lots of screaming girls in the audience despite the fact that most of the audience are male military officers in uniforms. The only women I see are Atlanta and Marina, and obviously, and Marina's not screaming, neither is Atlanta, but the Aquafibians are dancing to it, or bobbing up and down to it. This is a great cap, again, to the, the wonderful Titan side of this story, is that they watch the show and they genuinely enjoy the music. Not just, you know, Titan does it and maybe the others go along with it. Titan X20 and those two Aquafibians, they're all like, yes, this is good, I just... Excellent. Oh, God. It's beautiful. Next to zero. They're in a state of frenzy. He's driving them mad. What a wonderful weapon he is for us. If he keeps this up, they will be ready to be conquered in no time at all. Success at last. <laughs> <laughs> it's brilliant. It's, it's lovely to see these guys feeling like they've achieved something. We're not ending the episode with, oh, Stingray has defeated us yet again. It's like, no, we've actually succeeded. Hooray for us. It's such a positive moment it's such a positive ending all round so there we go that was titan goes pop <sighs> it's just a lovely story it's a lovely story i'm just watching the marina credit the, the marina song play out here and it's you're getting to this point in the show where she's she's not really a part of the show every week anymore so it's almost a bit strange seeing her on the end of this story, but oh my goodness, what a fantastic story. Again, such a, a simple idea that someone must have just read in the paper and thought, aha, we can do a Stingray story with this. And it's one of the, the greatest that they ever did. And I think genuinely one of the, um, the most successful comedic stories in the Anderson universe, possibly the most, because it doesn't undermine the characters. It doesn't do that thing that some shows do where we are doing a comedy episode and this means we're going to be very silly. No, you have a very outlandish idea. Play it dead straight. Filter the, the idea of filtering a, a 1960s pop star and how does that look to a race of, of underwater creatures who have no concept of anything like that? 
And the results are just some of the most amusing and entertaining moments in this whole show. So, yeah. Two thumbs up here for, for Titan Goes Pop with Stingray. It's, uh, it really is something to shout about. You see what I did there? Oh, never mind. There. Ah. Yes. Lovely. Uh, why don't you say that you'll always stay close to my heart, Richard ah, James? Well, that's very kind of you to say so. <laughs> I'm not saying it back, if that's what you're waiting for. No, no, no. Well, that's fine. Because that's very in keeping with Marina, because obviously she wouldn't say it back yeah, either. No, that's right. That's true. Yes. So, yes, I mean, would you say that I'm like the it. Troy Tempest to your Marina? <laughs> No, it's Chris no, I wouldn't. Atlanta. I wouldn't. No, uh, I, no, I wouldn't ever say either of those things. No, it's all, it's all got a bit weird. Um, I feel like it's probably time that <laughs> we wrap this would. one up. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. I think probably right. Okay, well, look, if you haven't subscribed, what are you doing? It's it's, it's madness, Podstrom. Yes, Press crazy. subscribe or press the plus button or whatever it is that you uh, listen to us on. And if you, even if you're on mm-hmm. YouTube, then you might as well subscribe to the YouTube channel while you're there. Yeah, I know sure. we keep threatening not? to not put the podcast on YouTube, but there's still lots of you yeah. to listen. So, you know, we'll yeah, see how yeah. we go. Um, make sure you tweet us and hashtag Jerry Anderson Podcast and tweet him, which then James, me, I'm oh. Jamie Anderson or him. Yes. Still over there now, post-randomizer, Chris yes. Dalek. Yeah. Join the podcast group at Facebook, facebook.com slash group slash yes. Podsterons and make sure to leave us a rating. That is oh, a yeah. review and rating because yep. I think we haven't had one on um, Apple Podcasts certainly since July. What? So if you're Maybe listening on... Stop listening. I don't think so. The, number, oh, okay. the numbers say people are still downloading. Fair so, enough. But if you're yep. listening on any platform, we really, really, really would appreciate uh, uh, a rating and a review. It's always lovely to get some feedback doesn't have to be perfectly nice and five starry but they, those are our well, favorites obviously it helps yeah um, but it means when other people look they go oh this is an interesting podcast because other people say so rather than because me richard and chris say so <laughs> yeah that's not really enough is it? and it's i'm not like even sure that reference. we would we would say so to be honest but oh, well, no, sometimes maybe yeah. if pushed mm. okay anyway that, that's it isn't it are we done yeah that's it i'm done i'm okay. spent i peaked well <laughs> 100 in about 1994 ago. okay yeah. yeah there we go uh lovely stuff well thank you all for listening uh Postrons. richard thank you for oh, continuing you. to be a wonderful co-host on this interesting podcasty ride certainly interesting that's a yeah, word i would use yes. absolutely and we'll be back in your dry or clammy ears Postrons, next week hashtag jerry Anderson podcast <laughs> see you then goodbye <laughs> One complete. Let's go. Spectrum is green. Now, I've had a thought, Jamie. Oh, what? Well, you know that big spiel? Yes, I know. The big spiel you did at the end there about subscribing and joining the Facebook group and hashtagging us on Twitter and giving out tags and all that. No, no, you got it absolutely right. That's my point. Why don't we just take that, snip it out, and put it in every week? And then I thought, hang on, how much of the podcast could we just lift from other podcasts and put together to make a new podcast every week? I think it would be possible, see? yeah. Yes, it would, wouldn't it? Yeah. Which would mean, you know, it'd take a bit less time and we could spend more time, you know, Pro- just lounging about the place. Probably more time for poor Ben and Laura producing and editing the podcast, <laughs> oh, I yeah. suspect. Yes, there is that. So there's it? a bit of a yes. false economy. Um, oh, all right. Well, it's just an idea. There. No, it's a, good, it's it's a great a good idea. idea. No, well, all it's, right. It, 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 it's a great idea is in an unusual and um, yes. Uh, yes. lofty idea. Uh, well, that's why I'm idea. Yeah, there you go. Just old, old lofty James. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I mean, in in time, very much like James L. Jones, I'm sure that yes. we'll both be uh, replaced by Reese Beecher. Well, now, how interesting, because that followed the news, if you haven't been aware of this, Podstrons, if you're still listening, that uh, James L. Jones has retur- uh, retired from uh, playing Darth Vader, but has given his permission uh, for the producers to... Uh, to use his voice and recreate it using software for any future projects. And that followed on just from last week from an email we had suggesting, would such a thing be possible for Jerry Anderson actors who are no longer with us? And, and should we do it? And would it ever happen? Well, 
there's an example of it happening in the real world right now. Absolutely. So, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, and it's the same company that we spoke to about um, cloning a dad's voice for the documentary, uh-huh. which we didn't end up doing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. All very yeah, interesting. There we go. Anyway, so who knows? It, maybe I've been cloned and I've not been here at all for the last 225 pods. Absolutely. You are actually hey. Wayne Forrester. Yeah. Uh, uh, the the secret vanishing house. Richard. Um, <laughs> yes. No, it, yes. it's not. It, it really is us, Postrons. It really is. Yes. Probably. More to the pity. <clears throat> anyway, from the real yeah. us. Yeah. Bye. Bye now. You have been listening to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Wasn't it fun? You have been listening to an Anderson Entertainment production.